There's um, a vote on the floor now. The members will <coughs> proceed, but I will continue with our, to accommodate our last witness. Mr. Giorgi, you may proceed. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify before this august uh, body. After 30 years of fighting and war, the guns in Eritrea are silent, and peace reigns everywhere. That includes also Ethiopia. <coughs> okay. Eritreans everywhere are rejoicing now, repeating the slogans of the civil rights movement, free at last, thanks God Almighty, we're free at last. And they're also repeating the slogans of the Jews who are remnants of the Holocaust by repeating their slogan again, never again, reflecting their dual heritage. <coughs> the provisional government of Eritrea has embarked on the restoration of public services right away. Food distribution is given the highest priority and is going on smoothly. The seaports of Massawa and Assad the international port in Asmara, as well as all major roads are open and movement of people and commerce is moving unimpeded both within Eritrea and between Eritrea and Ethiopia. In Eritrea, the price of staple foods has gone down by as much as 60% within the first week of liberation. Within Eritrea, electricity and water supply systems have been restored to normal operation after a disruption of more than two years. Hospitals and clinics have resumed their function. Law and order prevails everywhere. Perhaps the greatest benefit from the recent developments is the alleviation of different forms of human suffering. The Coptic Orthodox Church in Asmara has taken responsibility, full responsibility, to take care of all war orphans in the country. Families that have been separated for up to 30 years are going to be reunited. There are close to one million refugees in exile all over the world. It's appropriate to mention at this juncture that there is quite a sizable number of Eritreans residing in the United States, and many of them have picked up American nationality. And they're very much interested in what goes on in Eritrea. The home country is as close to them as the United States is. They all have adjusted to life in the United States. They all are participating fully in the economic mainstream, both in business and the professions. And Eritreans, both at home and here, are profoundly grateful to the government and people of the United States for the help given them in their time of need. Eritrean work ethic and resourcefulness will undoubtedly create an economic miracle similar to that of Southeast Asian countries. The already existing industrial base, almost at par with that of Ethiopia in terms of uh, capacity of production, <coughs> will help Eritrea attain self-sufficiency in many essential commodities and become a regional economic powerhouse within a short period of time. A sound market-based agricultural policy will enable the country to feed itself without any problems. My estimates, and I have been closely working with the relief organization in Eritrea, uh, are that the present famine in Eritrea is the last one. This could be done with minimal assistance to the farmers in the form of seeds, implements, and improvement of the basic infrastructure. The new government in Ethiopia has proven itself to be responsible and trustworthy. Its respect for human rights is shown by the way it treats the former government and Communist Party officials. The whole process of change of government was done so meticulously that the bloodbath many doomsayers were predicting did not materialize. It's to the credit of the Ethiopian and Eritrean peoples that the war ended without the anarchy that accompanied the fall of dictatorships in Liberia and Somalia. The U.S. government has played a historic role in bringing an end to the 30-year war in Eritrea and the 16-year war in Ethiopia. The decisive role played by Secretary Cohen in the London conference has made people who know the area and the nature of the conflict proud of the United States. 
his support for resolving the Eritrean issue through internationally supervised referendum and his courage to invite the EPRDF to take over Addis Ababa and to prevent bloodshed is highly commendable. In this regard, the U.S. administration has shown its commitment to democracy. And Mr. Cohen, as the earlier speaker has suggested, has earned his place in history. And I would add to that that in due course of time, if this process reaches its uh, logical conclusion, I have no doubt that Mr. Cohen will be a recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize. Equally important is the good understanding that exists between the governments of Eritrea and Ethiopia. The opening of the seaports of, for Ethiopian goods without any delay and other co ongoing relations are examples of the understanding between the two governments. Such an understanding is vital for carrying through the peace process and should be encouraged. The reaction of some elements of the Ethiopian exile community outside Ethiopia does not reflect the reality in the country. What we are witnessing here is a deliberate scheme of deception and disinformation to create the, the perception of instability in the country. The ultimate objective of such a campaign is to grab political power by any means necessary and at any cost. One way of doing so would be to bring foreign troops into the country. A former foreign minister under Haile Selassie, after spending his entire life or career advocating non-interference in Ethiopian affairs, was shown on CNN recently openly advocating for the OAU to send troops to Ethiopia. We know the consequence of such moves. The other allegation that the EPRDF, the group that has taken power, is dominated by the Tigrans and that the Amharas, the dominant group up to now, have been left out, falls in the same category. The composition of the EPRDF Council and the process they followed up to now shows that the Front is representative of the Amhara, Tigrans and other groups. During the last two years, the EPRDF was operating in the Amhara areas of the country. They lived with the people and shared their problems and views. They empowered the people fully by helping them set their own democratically elected local administration. By working close with the people, they managed to get their confidence and full involvement. The movement that overthrew the well-entrenched Mangustu regime was a movement of the people, and the Amhara people were very much part of this movement. They deserve credit. Knowing the tenacity and fiercely independent nature of the Amhara people, there is no other way any force could have passed through their territory except through their consent and participation. Documentary evidence from the area shows the sincerity and involvement of all the people. That's why there is no complaint or opposition from the Amhara people in Ethiopia. The only complaint we hear about is from here, 18th Street and Columbia Avenue. The people are part and parcel of the movement, and they are now the government. What's more, the people can speak and are speaking for themselves. The exile community in this country definitely can speak for itself. So far, these people do not offer any new approach or insight. In the name of national unity, they are advocating for a continuation of the war policy followed by the two previous governments. They distort history by claiming that Eritrea was part of Ethiopia for millennia, that Ethiopia, the Ethiopia they use for such purpose is the biblical name used for the entire black Africa. True, history shows that modern Ethiopia was a buffer zone created by European colonialists during the scramble for Africa towards the end of the last century, the same time that Eritrea was also colonized by the Italians. An international conspiracy denied Eritrea its right for independence and let it be annexed by the expansionist government of Ethiopia. The bloody war that followed and the attendant famine and human misery is the result of the denial of the Eritrean people's rights. The few weeks of peace that we have now seen are proof that the region's core problem has centered around the Eritrean issue. It is in light of such glaring evidence that some Ethiopian elites are aspiring for leadership roles and who believe that they are God's gift to the country are openly using every form available, including the U.S. government's media the Voice of America, <clears throat> for advocating ethnic violence and destabilization of the society. They apparently are convinced that they can fish only in troubled waters. And if the waters happen to be calm, they are prepared to agitate them, to suit their purpose. Thus, the choices available for the people and for their genuine supporters like the United States are very clear. 
whether to proceed steadily with the recent developments toward a lasting peace or go back to the horrors of yesterday. The people have shown their desire and commitment for peace. The U.S. should continue to play the historical and positive role it has embarked on. History will definitely remember this moment. In time, the people of Eritrea and Ethiopia will develop a solid relationship based on common interest and mutual respect. Such a relationship can be made to include all the countries in the region, region which may have to evolve with the establishment of customs union first, then a common market. Establishment of a democratic system of government and market economy can be conditions for joining such a union. Economic and other forms of aid can be used effectively as incentives for cooperation in the future. It's in light of all these positive possibilities that, Mr. Chairman, I urge your committee to support fully the move that's being taken by the State Department. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I think today's witnesses prove the need for a national meeting of reconciliation because of divergent views. However, the committee is privileged to have such outstanding scholars and witnesses here today. Men, uh, unfortunately no women, with deep commitment and a uh, wide range of uh, knowledge about the, their country. Mr. Giorgio, what is the ultimate objective of the EPLF in Eritrea? The official position of the EPLF regarding the future of Eritrea is to let the Eritrean people in a democratic process, such as a referendum, decide their future. But what, what, would, what do they perceive as their future? Uh, tentatively, there are uh, about four choices presented to the people. If they would like to be united with Ethiopia, that will be done. If they would like to have an independent state of Eritrea, that will be done too. If they want to have some kind of a federal arrangement, that's another possibility. And finally, any kind of regional autonomy could be worked out. But it's for the people of Eritrea to decide. So in a referendum, they will have a number of alternatives to options to review before they make a decision on the ballot, so to speak. There'll be these four options before them. Right. Okay. Uh, Mr. Woody, you want to comment on the, uh, the need for referendum or the request for referendum in Eritrea? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. I believe there is no need for any referendum. The, the reason one wants to have a referendum is to know the wishes and aspirations of the Eritrean people. Now, the Eritrean people, through several processes from, from the end of the Second World War, had gone through the acts and different stages of self-determination. The 1947 Four Great Powers Conference decided to set up a commission of investigation, sent that committee or commission to Eritrea to investigate on what the people of Eritrea wanted to do. That commission came with a recommendation that the majority of people wanted to associate themselves with Ethiopia. But later on, the Four Power Great Commission's responsibility shifted from there to the United Nations. And the United Nations set up a United Nations Commission for Eritrea, which had five members of it, three of whom were violently opposed against the, to the Ethiopian nation state, particularly Pakistan. That commission went to Addis Ababa, had ra attended rallies, went to churches, to synagogue, to mosques, visited schools and factories, and decided at the end of the day the vast majority of the people of Ethiopia want either total association with Ethiopia or some form of federal association. The commission went back to the United Nations and drafted a federal constitution for Eritrea, which was approved by the people through the Eritrean Assembly. And the, therefore, the decision on whether to belong 
or a member of Ethiopia has already been taken by the people of Eritrea. One cannot give the right of self-determination every 15 years or 20 years or every generation. And but if it is found necessary at some point in the future for the people of Eritrea to decide the future, well then, since there are so many developments since the Second World War and the people of Ethiopia are affected in many ways through direct cultural, political and economic interrelationship, that opportunity or that referendum should be made available, should be made open to the people of Ethiopia and so that the people of Ethiopia should decide. And more importantly, it should also be suggested the decision on whether one should have a referendum in Eritrea or the whole of Ethiopia should be preceded by the democratization of the political life of the people of Eritrea and Ethiopia. Because if a referendum were to be held today, now in Eritrea, it will be held under the totalitarian control of the Eritrean People's Liberation Front, which is a totalitarian organization with all the nomenclature of communist organizations elsewhere in Europe, in Eastern Europe. It had its cells and factories, in towns, in villages, and schools. And people will be forced, will be, will, will be forced, literally forced to vote for the referendum. There are some of us who cannot speak for the unity of Ethiopia, even in this country. We are harassed, harassed. Is it possible for an Eritrean living in Eritrea under these conditions to vote of his own free will to join Ethiopia? And therefore, these are some of the considerations that have been to taken into place, Your Excellency. Thank you very much. We have approximately five minutes. Let me pose a general question to all the panelists. What do you see coming out of the July 1 meeting? And are you satisfied or dissatisfied with all of the forces uh, non-military forces, political forces in Ethiopia are included in this July 1 meeting. Yes, please. If what the Assistant Secretary of State Kohn said today takes place, then a lot of Ethiopians will celebrate. You see, the issue in Ethiopia is not who rules, whether the Tigray, the Amhara, or the Oromo. The issue is what kind of rule. As long as it's a democratic process, and as long as a constitution that guarantees all the basic rights we have in this country is in place, we have come to live with Americans, with Ethiopians. And yet, whether Afro-Americans or uh, white Americans, uh, their culture is so far from ours. If we can have brothers and sisters here and friends, speaking for myself, I have a lot of Afro-American friends and white American friends too. If I can live with people who have such a diametrically different culture from mine, I see no difficulty in living with my Tigray brother, my Eritrean brother, my Amhara brother, my Walaitu brother, and all the other ethnic groups, because essentially what separates us is very superficial. So the issue is democracy, human rights. Professor? <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think uh, the July conference will be uh, definitely an important one to decide the future uh, of Ethiopia. And that is if one uh, the conference uh, will uh, have as participants all groups which may have various shades of opinions, uh, political opinions, views, and whether they are armed or unarmed, uh, at the moment, there seems to be the uh, uh, tendency <coughs> to exclude some groups because of their history, background, and so forth. I think it is in the interest of peace that there should not be any exclusion on any ground whatsoever. I do not belong to any political organization. 
uh, uh, you know, so I'm, I'm not supporting this or that. But I believe that if we want peace in Ethiopia, then there should not be exclusion based on any reason whatsoever. This is one. And there is a, a, a second snag, and that is, of course, a, a, an unfortunate one, uh, that the EPLF will presumably attend the conference uh, as an observer sort of thing, uh, uh, not really as uh, a participant and uh, 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 cooperating and taking part in the final outcome, that is to say, in the transitional uh, government. So, in effect, uh, we will have, in spite of the transitional uh, government that may be established after July 1, two separate uh, uh, systems. And uh, I see some uh, uh, possible uh, problems. Dr. Breyer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to, to make a few remarks uh, in relation to the question of unity before I come to the July conference. You've got all of one minute. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman, my position uh, as an Ethiopian is I stand for the unity of Ethiopia, but that unity has to be democratic and the people have to decide. So at the center stage should be the, the, the people, or all the people of Ethiopia to decide on the question of unity. It should not be the wish and desire of individuals or groups or political organizations. On the question of the um, July conference, I see it as a peace conference. And the forces, all the forces, be it they uh, are in, in, in the, within the country or without, the forces that stand for political and peaceful uh, and democratic resolution of the, all the conflicts of Ethiopia should be represented in the conference. I feel that regardless of whatever, um, whatever uh, crimes they committed against the Ethiopian people in the past, they should be allowed to face the Ethiopian people and therefore that peace conference should be all, uh, all embracing uh, all political forces that, w that advocate for peaceful democratic resolution of the conflict in Ethiopia. Thank you. Dr. Georgi, a very quick response. Uh, I, I am itching to respond to uh, Mr. Goshu Welde's uh, statements. No, no, let's pass that. All right, about the totalitarian, we'll, we'll the second meeting. Okay, about the totalitarian nature of the EPLF. I guess only him, as a former member of the Communist Party of Ethiopia, can see the inside mechanisms of Aparatici and how those systems work. But as far as I'm concerned, and from all evidence, the EPLF is not that kind of a government. So. I'd like to raise this um, for the record. Uh, as far as the uh, July conference is concerned, I also wish sincerely that all the parties concerned about the well-being of the country are represented because Eritrea needs a peaceful and democratic Ethiopia as its neighbor. Well, we want to thank all the witnesses for coming today. It's been, we've received some outstanding testimony. I want to announce that the committee intends to have uh, staff observers at the July 1 conference. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, Mr. Payne has a closing observation. And, I, and all of the statements of the witnesses will be entered into the record. Yes, I certainly would like to thank all of the participants who gave their points of view. I would hope, too, that the July 1 meeting, all parties could get around the table and discuss the future of, of Ethiopia, as it's been indicated uh, by the first respondent, that uh, if you can come here and live with people that have such different uh, colors and hues and and ethnicities from all around the world. It seems to me as an outsider, I'm not Ethiopian, although I know Tanestaning and sometimes I'm mistaken for Ethiopian. Perhaps that's where I came from originally, my forebearers. But the fact remains that 
to us outsiders to continually hear uh, the small issues that divide people who are almost all brothers and sisters. Uh, in the in 1991, we're talking like we would be talking 500 years ago. And it would appear to me that the women suffer, the children die. When we sit and pontificate about whether the 62 referendum was fair or not, and I never read where the people voted in the Atria in 62. I heard it went to the assembly and they cast the vote. And I don't know how necessarily it could be um, unquestionably a fair vote since the people did not speak. But that's behind us. And I would hope that the attitude at that conference table will be a little milder than some of the hard attitudes that I've heard from some of the participants here today. Mr. Thank Speaker, you very much. He has just drafted you to go as an observer to Ethiopia in July 1. <laughs> Meetings <Thank you>. adjourned. <laughs> to be with us Sunday evening for our weekly look at the people and politics of Great Britain. This week, it's question time from the British House of Commons. That's Sunday evening at 9 Eastern Time, 6 p.m. on the West Coast. Coming up next, a Senate Armed Services Committee hearing focusing on the role of women in combat. 